Hey everyone, welcome to the Conversations with Entrepreneurs series. My name is Joshua Fillmore. I'll be hosting the series on behalf of the USB Ed's Young Minds program. I'll be joined by a diverse range of some of the finest young entrepreneurs South Africa has to offer. We'll learn a bit about their journey, their thoughts on entrepreneurship and the role it plays in shaping the future of our country, and get a few first-hand tips for young entrepreneurs looking to start their own companies. Let's jump right in. Our next guest is Stellenbosch University's very own tech guru, Daniel Nowitzkas. Daniel is the founder and managing director of Specno, as well as the founder of Skudu, of Wardworks, and of The Playbook. Without a doubt, one of the most experienced young entrepreneurs in the country right now. Specno is a group of innovation specialists, which assist founders in turning their ideas into industry leading companies. They've recently been recognized as one of South Africa's top app development and user experience agencies. Dan, I admire everything you've done and are currently doing to push the local entrepreneurship scene. I know you're a wealth of knowledge on all things entrepreneurship, startup and technology. Awesome. What an intro. Thanks, Josh. So just to start it off nice and easy, can you give us a short overview of what Specno does and why it's important? Essentially, after taking sort of a trip to Silicon Valley and realizing, you know, how much innovation was coming out of a small 25 mile radius, um, I began to sort of look at what are the key ingredients that make up the valley and recognize that South Africa has sort of many of those key ingredients here that we need. Um, you know, we have the potential to start a lot of high growth tech ventures, but I think one of the main things that we're missing is the knowledge gap and then obviously the execution gap that, that comes with that. Um, and so Specno is what I like to call a venture catalyst where we essentially help entrepreneurs uh, start their venture and then have built up basically frameworks for success that take them from A to Z. Do you believe there is a, a step-by-step -step method or some kind of science to building companies that can be replicated over and over with new products? So I, I think, you know, there's no cookie cutter approach, but there's certainly patterns that you can pull out when looking at, you know, what makes a successful startup. Um, I do partly believe that the reason why Silicon Valley is a thriving VC scene is because they're able to operate at the scale that they can. And what that means is they sort of, go for this fail fast approach where they're pumping a bunch of money in, they're seeing sort of what the founders can do with that growth. And then they're giving their attention to the ones that show the most potential. But if you can capture those lessons along the way and sort of open source them, then I believe that you can set founders up for success. Ultimately, you know, it is on the founding team to ensure that the thing will be successful. You know, people like to say there's no such thing as a bad idea. There are bad ideas, but it's really the team at the end of the day that will take an idea, will pivot it until they find product market fit. Um, and then, yeah, from there, you should be able to build a company. Just following up on that, once these ideas are being transformed into companies, what role do you believe these companies play in, in shaping the future of our country and how important is it that we as an entrepreneurs start doing that and not necessarily wait on the general society or systems which have been built by government to do that for us so if we sort of just look at innovation as a seed to economic development i mean you've got direct jobs being cre created by entrepreneurs and you know startups contribute significantly to our GDP. But one of the things that don't get factored in are the indirect jobs and in the new markets that they create. I like to take sort of Apple as an example. Um, you know, I still see Apple as a high growth tech startup. And if we look at the iPhone, then, you know, there were hundreds of people, if not thousands of people employed to create this new device, this new piece of innovation. But not only, you know, did those people benefit from its development, but suddenly an entire new market was created, one where now millions of developers all over the world could create a, a business right from their garage, you know, could create new jobs that way. And suddenly new industries were popping up everywhere. 
And I know that, you know, in the past, people were scared that this whole fourth industrial revolution is going to destroy jobs, but it's disrupting jobs. It's creating jobs all the time. Um, and so I think if, if you rely only on corporates and places that are typically, you know, slowed down by bureaucracy, then you're going to see, you know, tiny amounts of innovation being released, but entrepreneurs move at different speed. And so they're able to leapfrog over problems, barriers to entry, um, you know, regulations most of the time. And so it's really up to the, the entrepreneurs to release innovation. I'm a young aspiring entrepreneur. I've got a game changing idea, but I'm not quite sure how to go about it. I come to Specno and I want you and your team to assist me. What are the first three steps you would advise me to take? So I think we would first need to figure out what stage of the venture, you know, the startup was actually at. You've got people who are very much just starting out. They have zero access to capital. They haven't really thought their idea through too much. For those people, we feel like they're even a little bit early for us. And so often we leave them with a few resources for them to upskill, sort of give them some measures for success or some actionable next steps. Um, it, quite a lot of it is just hashing out the idea a little bit more, thinking about you know the business model behind it, thinking about how it would scale, understanding a little bit more about the market, um, trying to sort of build out your core founding team, visionary, hacker, hustler. Um, and then sort of once you've got a little bit more of a base, then we would recommend starting at sort of your pre-validation phase. So that's typically your prototyping. You're very much going out and you're surveying the market. You're getting in front of your customers and you are sort of trying to get the information that will allow you to make key decisions to get to product market fit. You know, until you actually launch to the market, everything is just an assumption. But the more information that you can gather before you launch, obviously, the better design your solution is going to be. And then after you sort of have that down, then it's a case of how quickly can you build out an MVP or a prototype to actually test this traction um, while at the same time realizing that after you've proven your traction, the only way you're going to succeed in a high growth tech venture is to have your next steps already planned out. So, you know, how you would deploy capital, who you would raise from, how they would benefit you. Um, and so with each step of the way, you almost need to be thinking of the next leg of the journey and of how what you're currently doing impacts that and impacts your ability to sell that. One of the things which really stands out to me about Specno is your growth over the last two years. So when I met you, you were a team of two people. And I know at the moment you're a team of 26. And I understand that you guys aren't planning on slowing down anytime soon. Can you tell us a bit about this growth? Uh, what do you owe it to? And how have you actually gone about achieving it? There's a few things that have contributed towards our growth. Um, I think one of the first major things was finally picking up a book like for the first time, I was like, wow, reading is amazing. I can figure out so much about the future just by, you know, reading about what other people have gone through. The books were allowing me enough context to have an engaging conversation with somebody, which was teaching me how to grow a company. But then, you know, one of the things we were doing was pushing for sustained growth in the beginning. When you're starting and you never have more than six weeks of runway, it's always sort of a a scary, challenging time to grow. And I remember we were always operating on a model of have six weeks reserve. And then as soon as you breach beyond that, use that to inject in growth, whether that's sales and marketing or whether that's increasing your supply. So in my case, you know, hiring another developer. There's obviously a lot of differing opinions on when people should raise, how much they should raise, who they should raise from. And I'm curious to, to hear your insights on this. So to start off, at what point in a startup's journey do you believe they should seek to raise money? So interestingly enough, we've actually bootstrapped our way to this point. We've never raised. Um, we have raised through our other startups, like we've raised in Skudu, but Specno itself hasn't raised. Um, and so, you know, I might have a differing answer to many of the entrepreneurs. I believe that 
if you can bootstrap while you're figuring out, you know, your positioning in the market, finding your feet, learning a lot as an entrepreneur, you don't have to raise money to experience growth. One of the biggest things that I advise entrepreneurs is, is not to look for investment, but look for an extension of your team. And that's what a good VC should be. A, a good VC is essentially preparing you for the round of growth that, you know, should be their ticket. So, you know, if they're a Series A investor, then they should be able to help you scale your Series A. If they're a Series B or a Series C, then they should be helping you with new markets or new product extension. Um, and so it's very much about the network and the experience that they bring. But I think for us now, at least now that we are ready to deploy capital and we're ready for hyperscale, we're starting to consider raising capital. Up until then, I would I would say, you know, it's a bit of hustle. Do you feel as if your age plays for or against you in the business world and why? I think one of the, the big benefits of tech is that it's a relatively young man's game. Um, you know, I don't want to discredit the experience that you get from working in the industry for a number of years, but this is an industry where you can upskill very quickly and you can upskill from a very, very young age. Like we've got developers who've been coding since they were 12. And then we've got other developers who, you know, only started coding during varsity. And there might be like a five year age difference between the, the younger one who started coding at 12, but experience wise, they, they know different. One of the things that I, I, I did get right from a very early stage of starting was, recognizing how much more there was to know um, and just being vulnerable with the fact that I was starting out, that I was young and that I was looking for help. And like, I would contact my biggest competitors. I would speak to their CEOs and I'll be like, look, I'm really struggling. Can you give me some pointers? And I'm always blown away by what people are willing to share with me, knowing that I'm a competitor. Um, I think people are incredibly generous with their knowledge, especially when it's this like, older mentor versus younger apprentice. Um, and so, you know, from that perspective, age is certainly a door opener um, and you can definitely use it to your advantage. Can you share a few kind of hacks of yours which you put into practice in order to continuously learn and grow? Before I started, I never picked up a book, never read anything. Um, and then when I was starting, one of the, the big things was that I moved in with my co-founder and typically like I was quite a late riser. I would go to bed past midnight. I would typically try and wake up after nine. Um, and my co-founder convinced me that we should be hitting the gym at six so that we can get to the office by like seven or eight. And then we can sort of graph before any of the other staff come in. And that way we have some quiet time towards, you know, learning or just doing work. And very quickly, he wanted to sleep in and suddenly I was loving the fact that I'd gotten into a routine and that I could jump out of bed at six in the morning, bang on his door and be like, come on, you started this. Now we're going to, to gym at six. But the waking up at six sort of became a, a key part of my learning and my routine because I would search for a sort of a topic that I was wanting to upskill in and learn about. And typically an area of business that I was relatively nervous about, nervous because you know my inexperience meant that I was gonna make mistakes. And so before I even started the book, I knew that I wanted to listen to the book, I read the summaries. And so that morning routine be became a part of like the, the consumption. And then also when I got home and cooked in the evening or washed dishes, I realized that that was another time that I could plug in and, and listen to content. Thank you so much for joining us, sharing some of your insights with the Young Minds program. It's incredible to have you here. Awesome. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, thanks for the session. Thanks for watching this episode of Conversations with Entrepreneurs. For more info on the featured entrepreneur and their business, check out the links attached below. The series is proudly brought to you by USB Ed's Young Minds program which assists students in defining their life goals and creating their own career opportunities. I'd highly recommend checking out the program and visiting USB Ed's website for other world-class business learning opportunities. Until next time, cheers.